Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Berean Bible Church, Grace Life Church. We're located in Evansville, Indiana. Um, this is our Sunday school hour, um, but if you want to know more about us, websites gracelifeunleashed.com, YouTube Grace Life Unleashed by Dave Sigmund, Facebook, Rumble, everything goes back to YouTube. And if you go to YouTube, please subscribe and all that good stuff. Um, we started out uh, a few weeks ago, and we talked a little more last week about what's the difference between saved and lost, and more importantly, why are you lost and why are you saved? And it's a pushback against Calvinism and Arminianism in regards to the fact that just because Christ died on the cross for your sins does not mean you're saved. It means you're savable, whereas the Calvinists will say, no, if Christ died for your sins, you're saved whether you know it or not, and Arminianism will teach the same thing. And my response to that is, no, you're both wrong. So that's why I don't like Calvinism and I don't like Arminianism, because I don't think they understand what happens at the moment of salvation. Now, the cross of Christ did forgive our sins. And um, 1 Timothy 2, if you listen on Wednesday, I go through this verse every single week. You know, Paul starts out in verse 2, he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And for kings and all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And, and the reason I go here on Wednesdays is, is God's goal is that we lead a quiet and a peaceable life. How's that going for you, Nancy? Fair. Fair? Okay, good, good, good. Um, <laughs> God is not looking for us to overthrow the government. God is not looking for us to take over the government. God has not promised us the government. We are not the nation of Israel. Okay? And there are a lot of people that's called the replacement theology. They say that the body of Christ is the replacement for Israel, and Israel has been given the authority to take over the world, which they will do in the kingdom. You know that? But we're not in the kingdom. We're not Israel. We're not spiritual Israel. We're not the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ, which is an entirely new, different animal. So you can't name it and claim it. God has asked us to be quiet <laughs> and peaceable, which me, to me means living under the radar. And did Paul ever um, lead a protest to overthrow the Roman government? Does anybody know? No. You must have missed that one. It's probably a different book, you know. Well, why didn't Paul, I mean, do you think Paul liked the fact that the Roman government had occupied Israel? No, I think he hated it. But why didn't he get involved? Because whose world is this? Satan's world, okay? And how long is Satan going to have control of the world? Until the end of the tribulation. And then what's going to happen to Satan? He's, he's, bound yeah, he's going to be bound up for a thousand years, and after a thousand years, he's loose for a season. And then what happens to him eventually? Lake of fire. And then who gets to take over the world? Well, the kingdom. <laughs> the kingdom takes over the world. We take over the heavenlies, and we all live happily ever after. But we're not there yet, okay? And then Paul says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And here we go. Who will have all men to be saved. Now, will all men be saved? No. But does the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ make all men savable? Yes. yes. So, a man lives his entire life, does not accept Christ as his Savior, and he dies. Does God take back that promise? No. no. He didn't take, uh, he created uh, Lucifer to live forever. He didn't take that back. Right, right. Lucifer will live forever in his, in his, in the lake of fire. <laughs> All right, so... If Christ died on the cross for the man who didn't get saved, is that a waste of God's blood? Because he did die, or his, his energy. And that, that's what the Calvinists and the Arminianism people don't want to do. They don't want to have somebody dying who didn't believe because Christ already paid for their sins. You see where the problem comes up in their head? It's, it's, it's their private answer for that, but anyway, but we're going to get to that. But now Paul goes on, he says, and to come to a knowledge of truth. So Satan's number one goal is that all men not be saved, right? Satan doesn't want people saved. But after you're saved, Satan can't make you lose your salvation, praise the Lord, right? But Satan still doesn't love you. <laughs> what does Satan want next? He doesn't want you to know the truth. Now, what, what truth is that? Anybody know? What truth is Satan trying to, that the earth is flat? Is that the truth Satan's trying to stop you from learning? Do any of you believe, do any of you believe the earth is flat? 
No? <laughs> my brother does. And my niece told me that we don't talk about that. But <laughs> I guess people who believe in a flat earth take that, that doctrine very seriously. That's fine. The truth that Paul, Scott said the truth, this, that the gospel of the grace of God, the grace message. Because if Satan, even though he lost you as far as salvation goes, if you don't know the truth about grace, then when you start talking to other people, you're not going to teach them grace either. So it's, you know, I always say Satan wants to keep you disqualified, you know, keep you on the sidelines, and that's what he's up to today. So for most of us, remember, Satan doesn't want you to know the truth. He can't, he can't lose your salvation, but you can be ineffective, and that's what he wants you to do. And then he goes on and says, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Our salvation comes through Jesus Christ, okay? Our faith is in Christ. And guess who Christ's faith is in? You guys know? God the Father. Okay, that's why we have to believe that Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Christ believed that God would do what he said he would do if he died for the sins of the world. So that, that's good. All right, now, in Romans chapter 2, this thing, I don't know why this thing is so jumpy. I've been doing this a lot lately. Um, all right, here we are. Romans 2.1 is where these people have the answer, which I think is wrong on what happens if somebody doesn't believe, the, the Calvinistic Arminian people, okay? In Romans 2, 1, it says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest does the same thing. And what he's saying there is, you know, it's do as I say, not as I do. You know, and people are all guilty of that. Um, a lot of people are guilty of that. And that's what Paul's pushing back on. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth against them which commit such things. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what he's talking about. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and does the same, that thou should escape the judgment of God? And the answer to that is uh, no. God does not have favorites. Or despisest thou the riches of this goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Now, today, under grace, is God actively judging or tormenting or in any way messing with the lost? In other words, is he making their life miserable because they're not saved? No. Not yeah, he's not. He, so he's, it's good. He's not imputing sins. In the same sense, God is not actively, I believe, involved in our lives in the sense of hurting us or chastising us or testing us either. Okay? Everybody has the grace of God today, no matter how they live, good, bad, or ugly. Remember that, okay? But, okay, forbearance and long-suffering. So God is long-suffering, right? It doesn't mean that the, the lost are going to be inexcusable. And it, it actually doesn't even mean that you and I, if we do something stupid as a grace believer, that not, we're not going to be, and I'm not going to say punished, lose rewards, okay? And there's a big difference in that. We're going to see that this morning in our main service in regards to two things. As a member of the body of Christ, God is going to reward us for faithful living. What is that reward? Does anybody know? I think it's a position within the heavenly realm. I think it's what it is. I don't, I don't think it's anything more than that. Um, um, some people say it's crowns of righteousness, and then we're going to give them back to Christ because of what he did. So that leaves you with nothing, but it, it doesn't even really matter. The point is, you're going to be rewarded for that faithfulness. The loss of rewards is a loss of rewards because of a, of a lack of faithfulness in something you do. It, it's kind of like if you guys grow a garden. Scott, you got a garden. How's your garden growing? Oh, I'm breaking up for a reason. <laughs> When Scott grew, planted his seeds, the potential was what? Amazing, right? And then what happened? It rained too much. The weeds grew. You had what? He has deer tracks and probably bunny tracks too, but they don't leave many holes. <laughs> uh, it got too dry. It got too hot. The you know, um, la fungus, lack of fertility. All that. So now the potential was amazing, and now we're back to what? A mediocre, poor crop, right? <laughs> I'm being funny. Um, that's kind of like what our life will be. Our potential is amazing, but if we mess up, we're, we're still got a crop. You know, God's still going to let us into heaven, but we don't get as many rewards. So it's a loss of potential rewards. 
There's no Christian going to get to heaven and go, you know, Scott, I had a lot of hope for you, but you were a failure. So you're in that door over there that says directly go to hell. You have to go on that door because you are just a failure. There is no door like that in heaven. <laughs> okay. This is not a judgment to see who gets to stay. This is a judgment for rewarding faithfulness. Now, again, I think it's positions of authority within the heavenly realm. Um, somebody's got to follow those horses around in heaven and <laughs> clean up, okay? That might be me, James. I'm being funny. Paul, Paul <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 3, he laid the foundation. Okay. But let every person take heed how he builds their own. Right. But you build with gold. Right. It's up to us. That's, it's, it, God is not going to make you do anything. You know? And here's the thing is, when we get to heaven, we're all going to have perfect English. So Nancy will not be able to correct anything I say because I'll have all the right words. And I'll be able to pronounce them right. So Nancy, you don't have a job in heaven either. All right. <laughs> it's, all right. So again, God is not actively in any way punishing the lost because they're lost here on earth. And that doesn't mean they're going to get out of it. When is God going to punish them? Great white throne, which takes place after the thousand years. All the lost are judged. And again, that's the same thing. There's nobody going to show up at the great white throne and God's going to go, why are you here? <laughs> Take that door there that says go to heaven. We messed up on our paperwork. That, no, that's not going to happen as far as that goes. Now, this is what they say. Okay, and I, I don't believe that this is what this verse says. But after thy hardness and impotent hearts treasured up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of righteousness, righteous judgment of God who will render every man according to his deeds. What they say is this, and this is the verse they use. When you die, even though your sins have been forgiven, because you didn't believe, God puts your sins back on you. Okay? Because you didn't believe. Because we can't have Christ dying for sins of people who are lost. And I always go, why not? <laughs> because then they would be saved. <clears throat> No, that's not true. It just means they're savable. Because having your sins forgiven never saved anyone. You know that? It makes you savable. And I mean, my proof text for that is, um, it's jumping around then. Um, here. I'm just going to have to get a new clicker or something, maybe. Mm -mm. All right, now. There we are. And I, well, you know, get back right. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. Now, this is the, when the lost are going to stand before God and they're going to be judged. Now, the question is, are they going to be judged for their sins or for something else? Well, they... Yeah, it says, it says works. You're getting ahead of me, James. <laughs> if God puts their sins back on them again, then we're going to judge them for their sins because all have sinned. Now, if their sins are forgiven and God didn't put them back on them, how can God judge them for their sins? Because their sins have been forgiven. It's like double jeopardy. You can't be ready to take care of that. But, but having your sins forgiven does not make you saved. It makes you savable. Now the question is, are you righteous enough? That's the answer to why the lost go to the lake of fire and why the saved go to heaven. And, and this is where, this, this is that whole big spiel that happened about 20 years ago at a BBS, a BBF conference in regards to righteousness and when universal reconciliation came in and all that whole mess, okay? So we have a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. In other words, you can't get out of that judgment if you're lost. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. Now, when I talk to guys who believe that God puts their sins back on them, because when you ask God to forgive you, then he actually forgives your sins. And I said, no, didn't that happen at the cross? No, 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 that, that didn't happen until you asked God to forgive you. No, that's not exactly what's going on there. All right, so the person said to me, Dave, you know, you know those are works of sin. And I went, yeah, but why does it say works? Mm -mm. Okay, see what I'm saying? Are we, are we being picky? Yeah, we are. But it's, the, the, it's works. Now, what are works? Deeds. Deeds. So if you're going to stand before a judge, okay, and you did something wrong, and you actually did something wrong, and you're going to say, but judge, I'm actually really a good person. I just made a mistake. 
you're going to tell the judge of all the what? The good things you did to prove that this one mistake isn't as big of a deal as it is. Versus if you show up in court and says, um, sir, you've been convicted of 57 crimes already. Why is this one different than the other 57? You don't have much of a case. But when you stand up and say, look, this guy doesn't have a parking ticket, and he made a mistake, okay? So let's not be as you know, mean to him as we could be if he would have had all these other priors, okay? So you're going to ask for what? Mercy, probably. You know, mercy is I'm, I'm guilty, but don't give me what I deserve. Now, all of us have been given mercy from God because all of us deserve what? The lake of fire. But God's not giving to us because of his love for us and through Jesus Christ. So what kind of things would a lost person show God to prove that they don't deserve to go to the lake of fire? I went to church. I gave money to the poor. Uh, I wasn't that bad of a person. I got baptized in water, forwards, backwards, inside out, six times, two times. I did all 20 of them. Um, I, you, you name it. I tied 10% when I remembered. <laughs> you know. You're going to give God all the good things that you've done in the what? Flesh. <laughs> Is there anything you could do that's good enough to, to work your way up to heaven? <clears throat> to please God. No, no. And I said before, and I truly mean this, if we could see, and I don't believe God's going to show this to us because it would just create anxiety and, and almost depression probably in us. If we could see everybody who is in the lake of fire today, we'd be amazed at some of the quote-unquote good people that are there. Nobody there yet. Well, that are going to be there, okay. <laughs> Versus some of the people... And again, because we're not going to have our old nature, you know, like, you know, let me use the example, Bobby, and I don't. Bob, you made it to heaven, Bobby? We get to heaven. <laughs> I think you were the last person I thought would get to heaven. You were such a scumbag. Well, how in the world did you ever get here? You know, again, I'm just teasing. But there's going <laughs> to, yeah. And Bobby looks at me and goes, because I trusted in the blood of Christ, Sigmund, <laughs> not in my works. And again, there's a difference. So you're going to have people who have amazing works that are headed to the lake of fire and people in heaven that didn't have amazing works, but they trusted in Christ. Now, what happens at the moment we trust in Christ that makes this whole thing different? God places his righteousness. Now, how, how perfect is God's righteousness? 100% perfect. It's God. God places his righteousness on us. Not by works righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Our works never saved us. There's not a single work you could do to get you any closer to heaven than you were before. In fact, it probably takes you further away. So, when God looks at a saved person, what does he see? Righteousness. That's the difference. That's why the saved are saved, and that's why the lost are lost. So, what I, the comment I made years ago, and, and I had to take it back because people misunderstood me, although it's a true statement, that there are people going to hell with their sins forgiven. Is that a true statement or not? It's true. It has to be true. But the reason they're not in heaven is because they're not righteous enough, because they're trusting in their own works of righteousness. This is a works of righteousness that is not going to get them saved at all. That's the big difference. And the sea gave up the dead which was in them, and it and the dead and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. This says works for a, for a reason, guys. It really does. Words do mean things. So the answer is righteousness, Okay. And the death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That, that book must be important. I, have, I made the comment, I don't believe our names are in the book of life. You guys know that? You know where I believe our names are? <laughs> in the body of Christ. Now, if that means we're in the book of life too, so be it. But I, I don't believe that, that that's important to us as a member of the body of Christ because we are in the body. All the magic takes place in the body. That's where we're declared righteous and all those cool things. Now, Titus 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. Sounds like a lot of Christians I know. Okay. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior towards men appeared. Here we are. Not by works of righteousness. Now we're back to the 
great right throne judgment. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Okay? Romans 3.21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, or there is no difference. How important is being declared righteous? It's like the key. <laughs> it's the key. <laughs> it's the key, yeah. How righteous do we have to be to get into heaven? As righteous as, as, righteous as God. Can we ever do that on our own? No. No. No, it's impossible. That's why we have to get over ourselves. And that's why we spend so much time saying, you know, it's not by works, it's by faith. You know, so where do works come in in regards to salvation? It's after salvation. It's after salvation. Very good, James. It has nothing to do with salvation. Yet where does the flesh want to put it? Before salvation. You know, everybody wants to help God. There's this common saying, well, what, what God did when he died on the cross was he opened the door and he made salvation possible. Now we have to do our part, which is what? Work our way through it by doing good works. That, that's what the flesh and the world wanted. That's what religion wants to teach you. That'll send you straight to hell. You know? Again, if you talk to the average American, I know some of this stuff is repeat, but, and you ask them if they're going to heaven, the average American will probably say, I hope so, or I think so. Most people don't say yes with a, with a strong yes to me. They don't. Well, why do people doubt their salvation? They don't know what the Word of God says. They don't know what the Word of God says. And what are, what, in their mind, they're thinking what? It's based on works. Their works. And they always want to say, somebody said, what is it? Are they good enough? They're not quite sure if they're good enough. Now, most people, what's the standard of being good enough? It's, it's not God's righteousness because then they would never make it. it. It's good enough compared to what? Other people. Or their mind. What they think, you know, well, compared to that guy, I'm going to go to heaven twice, you know. It, 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 it's a crazy world out there. So that's why I said, in order to get somebody saved, the first thing we have to do is get them lost. You know that? How do you get somebody lost and prove to them that they're not headed to heaven. Well, well you basically you got to prove, them, yeah, the law works. The purpose of the law was to prove that, you know, that man was not savable. You know, have, have you ever lied? You know. Not <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, define what, define what lately means. <laughs> you know. If, if your wife asks you, does this dress make you look fat? And you say, no, is that a lie? You tell me. All right, no. <laughs> is, there, is a white lie considered a lie? <laughs> there you go. A lie is a lie. So how many lies keep you out of heaven? How about a white lie? Does that keep you out of heaven? <laughs> yeah. See? We're, we're, we're done. So it really shouldn't be that hard to convince somebody that they are a sinner, but somehow that's not, they think it's some giant scale in heaven that, you know, a balanced scale, and somehow they, they're good enough. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Again, sin is the problem, okay? And that's why Christ died on the cross. Now the answer is, our question is, are you righteous enough? So what, what do we, you know, when you look at the Calvinists who say that God looked and decided who he was going to die for. And the Arminians said, well, God looked who would freely, freely decide they want to believe in Christ, and he only died for those. Why do they have such a big problem with Christ dying for the lost? Because that's what the problem is. They said, no, we can't have Christ dying for people that aren't going to be saved. Because what's the problem with that? Because in their minds... They're saved, because <laughs> that's, that's what saves them. Because they say, what you, when you tell God, you know, you've heard the sinner's prayer. Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I want to be part of your family. Now, hasn't God already forgiven us? 
So that means we're already saved. See, that, that, the issue is not sin. The, the sins of the world were taken care of at the cross, but that only makes you save a bull. Now the question is, are you righteous enough? And the answer is no, and that's why you have to believe that Christ died on the cross. Then God places you into the body of Christ, and everybody in the body of Christ is declared 100% righteous. There's the answer, okay? For all sin to come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, that's a substitute through the faith of His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now, the next question that comes up, and this is, you know, the blood of Christ is very important. Christ dying on the cross for our sins is very important. And it gets into this whole thing, and we discussed this before, but I wanted to get this on video. The issue of, in a sense, accountability, okay? Now, do aborted babies go to heaven? Yes, every single one of them. Did an aborted baby ever believe that Christ died on the cross for their sins, was buried, and rose again? No. So how in the world did God let them into heaven without a statement of faith from them? Does anybody know? Sorry, what? Accountability. That is why the blood of Christ is so important in regards to the issue of righteousness. Now, if you are not accountable for your actions, then you didn't commit any sins of unrighteousness. Does that make any sense? In other words, the day you were born would have been a good day to get into heaven before you did anything wrong, but the first thing a kid does when it's born is what? Cry. Cries. That's a sin as far as I'm concerned. You know, Why do babies cry? Because <laughs> they're self... No, forget about the medical thing. You've got to clear their lungs. Yeah. yeah. This is a total rabbit trail. My last baby was born. It was a C-section, and the doctor goes, when a C-section baby is born, it doesn't act the same way as a normal baby is born because it's very lifeless. We have to actually whack it a few times to get it to jump in order to start breathing. Whereas the trauma of being born is enough to make any baby cry normally. <laughs> and the mom cry. <laughs> no, you're <laughs> So they said, don't think the baby is dead or something. And that's true. It really is. The baby's just because it's, it's happy inside mommy's tummy and hooked on the bill cord. It doesn't know it has to breathe until they whack it a few times and get all that gunk out of its lungs and stuff. But a uh, whole, whole other point. Um, do you have to teach your kid how to be selfish? How long does it take that kid to become selfish? What was that? One second. One second, yeah. The second goes, it's about me. <laughs> Did baby Jesus ever cry out of, out of pride and, and out of selfishness? I don't think so. Must have been a really nice house to be in. <laughs> so, so. All right, so the, the fact that Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again, is very important for those who don't have to show their righteousness because, again, they don't have their their works of righteousness are, are unrighteousness on them. And God has decided that the issue is accountability. And in the book of Jonah, it says they don't know their right hand from their left. That, that's what Jonah says, why the kids are saved. Okay? And even you go back and look in um, uh, Exodus, and when, the, when they went through the uh, desert, um, remember God said, you guys are all going to die in the desert? But he didn't say from zero to whatever. He started at, and I keep getting that wrong, I keep saying 30, but I think it's 20? 20. 20. Anybody who's 20 and younger gets to go into the promised land. Why is that? Because God decided that anybody who's 20 and older is accountable for their actions. Anybody who's 20 and younger is unaccountable. Now, I don't know. Do you guys think a 20-year-old is unaccountable for their actions? What age do people become accountable for their actions? This varies between men and women, though, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when do men finally become accountable for their actions? 83. 83. Oh. <laughs> David, how old are you? <laughs> no, women, women do mature. Women do. They claim it's an issue where you're front brain connects with your left and right brain come together and that's yeah and that that's when you have the ability to have reason yeah and things like that i don't know um that is why aborted babies 
get to go to heaven because they didn't commit any sins of unrighteousness, okay? They're considered righteous. And I think that's also true for people who are emotionally unable to make decisions in their life, um, compromised emotionally, you know. So now let's say that you're involved in the car accident at, you know, 50 years old and all of a sudden you become a, a vegetable. You now are incapable of making decisions. But guess what? There was a time in there when you were capable of making decisions, so it's too late, okay, as far as that goes. Um, so someone told me that when somebody's in a coma, they still can understand or hear you and that you should witness to people in comas because they may have the ability to process things. I don't know if that's true or not, but it doesn't hurt to try. So, so anyway, so why is this important, okay? To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and a justifier of him who believeth in Jesus Christ. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No. By the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. If you were to get your, I don't know, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, 3 minutes of fame in front of a national camera, what would you say? You know? Show me the money. <laughs> Show me the money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. You know. You get these guys that, you know, thank God because they ate a home run or whatever the case may be. I, I'm not quite sure that that's God let them hit that home run or wherever the case may be. Um, we want to give God the glory. We want to thank Jesus Christ for what? Dying on the cross for our sins, being buried, and rising again. Our salvation has nothing to do with us. It never had anything to do with us. So we need to get over ourselves and give the glory back to God. That, that's the key to, to anything, is getting people to get over themselves more than anything else, as far as that goes. All right, Romans 4. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is retaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. But what saith Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What did Abraham believe that God declared him righteous? Now again, it's always been righteousness. Did Abraham believe that Christ died on the cross for his sins and he was buried and rose again? Nope. nope. How much of that do you think Abraham understood? Zero. Someone say zero. Yeah, nothing. Not at all. Um, so what did Abraham have to believe? Now again, the reason Abraham did not have to believe that Christ died on the cross for his sins was buried and rose again, because that was not Abraham's gospel. That was not the entrance into his eternity. God has always had different entrances into eternity in times past. If you were around in Acts chapter 2, you did not have to believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again either. You had to believe that Christ was the Messiah, the Son of a living God. That's it. Well, what about his death, burial, and resurrection? They might have known it, but that was not required for their salvation. There's a lot of things that go on in your life at the moment of salvation that you don't understand and, and don't believe because you don't understand them, but they still happen. The most important thing you need to understand is what do you have to believe? The bare minimum that you have to believe in order to get into heaven. And what's the bare minimum? Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and rose again. So what was the bare minimum that Abraham had to believe in this reference here that Paul's talking about? Abraham believed God. What did God tell Abraham? There you go. Yeah. Get. <laughs> And because Abraham getted, <laughs> what did God promise him? I will make of thee a great nation, and all the nations or all the children or all the people there shall be blessed through you. Abraham getted, and God did what he did. There. Now, Abraham took Lot with him, and I think that was an issue until Lot left that God didn't really totally fulfill it. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Um, you go to work every day, you expect to be what? Paid. Is that grace or that debt? That's debt. Okay. There's a big difference there, more than anything else. What, what work did we do to earn salvation that God owed us salvation? Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing we could do. Why did God give us salvation even though he, he knew that we were unworthy of it? What did we have going for us? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. So why did Christ die for us? 
He loved us. There you go, James. He loved us. He knew the only way to fix us was for him to personally fix it. And there's nothing we can do except say, thank you, Lord. I really appreciate it. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith, again, our faith is in what? Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again. Our faith is counted for what? Righteousness. There's that word again. How important is righteousness? Really, really important. Because <laughs> that is the key to get into heaven, is you've got to be just as righteous as God. So because we believe that Christ took our place, our punishment on the cross, God said, because you did that, I'm going to declare you as righteous as me, myself. That's what makes us saved. That's why the lost, who have their own righteousness, can't get into heaven. And no matter how good of a person they are. Remember when Christ ran into the rich young ruler? And Christ told him to just obey the law. What did the guy say? I'm doing it. I am a good kid. And Christ never said, liar. He didn't disagree with him. But then he told him to what? Sell everything you have, give it to the poor. Which meant the guy was trusting in his what? His riches. And he went, I can't do that. And so he walked away. So he, he wasn't trusting totally. Um, more than anything else. Even as David described the right blessedness of a man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. Uh, David realized how bad of a person he was. Saying, blessed are, thy, are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. When David committed the sin of adultery and murder, because he, he had Uriah killed, murdered. It wasn't in the act of war. It was doubt and out murder. What under the law should have happened to David? He shouldn't put to death for either one of those. Um, but God said, no, you're not going to die. Um, and that's why David said things like this, because he knew what forgiveness felt like. Cometh this blessedness upon, then upon the circumcision only, or upon uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How is it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Abraham becomes our example as grace believers of faith plus nothing. You know that? Now, why did God add works to Abraham's promise? You guys know that? Because then he said, oh, we're going to start adding what? Circumcision to Abraham. What, what was the problem that was, was, was happening? What was required before circumcision in order to be part of the club? You had to be related to what? Abraham. <laughs> that was it. You know. When Isaac was born, was he part of the club? Yes. Yeah, but then God already had to add circumcision. What was the purpose of adding the law? Why did God add the law not to say, hey, you're an Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that's good enough? There you go. What, what, what were the children of Israel doing? Sinning, getting sloppy, you know. They had all the blessings without any of the responsibility. When, when Jacob was fleeing his brother, and he saw Jacob's ladder, remember? If you go back and read that account, and I should have put it in here. You know what he told God? If, if I can go back to my father, father's house after he dies, and everything's cool, and you make me rich like you promised, then I'll serve you. In other words, do what you're going to do, and then I'll serve you. That's what was wrong with the, the law before the law, before circumcision, is they got all the blessings no matter how they lived. And we saw the starting to break down in just with circumcision. Because after what was required after circumcision? You know, first it was circumcision. So if you were circumcised, you were part of the club. I don't know if you're following me on this. Um, so you look at uh, Jacob. Was Jacob a good kid? Uh, yeah, was Jacob a good kid, do you think, overall? What was Jacob's problem, that he stole his brother's birthright and stole his brother's blessing? You guys, what, what, was, what was the problem? Self, I think his, his, he had a lot of bad influence from his mother and, and things like that. It was all everything, it was all a mess. Did that create problems in his life because he wasn't trusting in God alone? 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I would think the law was added to, to help these guys understand, you got a problem here. You need to start trusting in me more. Again, the law was given because of unrighteousness and because of transgressions. All right. And he received the sign of circumcision, the seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So again, righteousness, 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 righteousness. It was all about righteousness even way back then. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet un circumcised. Abraham believed God and it was just counted to him for righteousness. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Again, Paul uses Abraham for a reason because it would be for circumcision. The, the, the magic happens when you believe that Christ took our place, our punishment, God places it in the body of Christ and we're sanctified, we're justified. There's like a hundred different things that happen, but the most important thing is that we're righteous and we're declared as righteous as God himself, and now we're perfect. So the lost go to the lake of fire because they're not righteous enough, even though Christ died on the cross for their sins. So the Arminians are wrong, the Calvinists are wrong, their whole doctrine is wrong. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for salvation. Lord, you did all the work, but we have to get over ourselves and realize that it's not about us. You don't need our help. You never did. If we could do it on our own, you would have had us do it on our own, but we're a failure. And Lord, we thank you that you loved us and you died for us, and all we have to do now is just believe. And Lord, we pray that as we talk to people, we'll express that to them, that we'll have the words to say to them that they'll understand this also. It's difficult to talk to people, Lord. I, I know people get very upset when you tell them they're a sinner. People get upset when they, they, you tell them they need Christ. But, Lord, we pray for the, the courage to do that. We pray also in your name. Amen. Thank you, folks.